Happy Father's Day, everyone. To fathers, I'm, so, I'm supposed to say of fathers of all shapes and sizes, so I can equal it out with what I said to the women. Just kidding. <laughs> Although I think most dads and fathers aren't insulted by that. Anyway, we're in vacation mode, and we're going to be a little more laid back, or at least try to, try to. In the month of June, there are lots of celebrations, lots of people going on vacation. So I'll be celebrating 15 years as a priest in a couple weeks on June 28th. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be celebrating actually eight years as pastor of St. John's on the next day, June 29th. And then actually a big celebration, my mom and dad, Bob and Susie Reichlin, June 30th, will be celebrating 50 years of marriage. So congratulations to them. And I'll actually be away that weekend, July 1st and 2nd, swapping with one of the priests in my home parish so that I can uh, be there to help renew their vows at my home parish. So I look forward to that family celebration. Oh, in addition, by the end of June, I will have had three weddings here in the parish, or three couples. Many others are celebrating anniversaries, graduations, many family gatherings, Next week, we're having vacation Bible school, which should be a wonderful, awesome time. So a lot of celebrations, a lot of joyful things. I've always heard it said from the time in seminary, don't vacation from your vocation. <laughs> in other words, don't neglect God and your spiritual life as you go out on vacation this time. It can make all the difference in times of celebration and recreation to take a little time to carve out a little time for you and God. So it being Father's Day and be celebrating my vocation, I'd just like to tell a little highlights of my vocation story. It has several different steps, several different holy moments I experienced that led me here to be a priest, but a couple I just highlight. Well, first, I've told many times the story when I was in ninth grade of my youngest brother Aaron passing away and that tragedy in my family life, that gave me a deeper perspective on life and perhaps a higher purpose. Well, there was really the seed of my calling planted there. And I always blame my little brother Aaron for becoming a priest. It's your fault. And then uh, I'll fast forward to college where I was a biology pre-med student and seminary was option C pretty much. I was thinking of several other things, and finally, when I was thinking of my vocation and, and taking the plunge and entering seminary, I was looking at different options. I was looking at being a parish priest, that is a diocesan priest, living in a parish, serving on the front lines, or I was looking at a religious order, like the Jesuits or the Franciscan, because I was attracted to becoming a missionary to going to a foreign country perhaps, a, an exotic location where I could serve the poor and announce the good news. I remember very distinctly sitting down in the rectory of my home parish with Father Don Williams, who's now at St. Matthew's. At the time, he was the vocation director for our diocese, and with Father Rich Gezi, who was my pastor at the time. And we laid out the pros and cons of going into a religious order versus becoming a regular parish priest. And it turns out I was attracted to this because there was in a, a sense of sacrifice and mission of just being stuck my whole life in Northeast Pennsylvania. <laughs> it, I had a sense from the get-go, even as a young man at that time, that I was called to be a missionary in the local church. And maybe parish priests back in the old days didn't think of it that way. But I, from the very beginning, thought of my calling to be in a parish, working with people, as being a missionary. So in the next few weeks, we're going to hear from Matthew chapter 10 in the gospel. It's the great speech on mission that Jesus gives to his disciples. We're going to take a look at that. And it's a great opportunity for us to reflect on the church today and our calling to be missionaries. Not just me as a priest, 
but all of us together called by Jesus to go and make disciples. So the need is obvious. The mission field that we have to announce the good news is everywhere around us. It's in our families. It's our households. It's at work. It's at school. It's among your friends, your classmates. The mission field is everywhere today. It's obvious that there's a a new approach needed that's different than maybe the way you grow up. Because there's so many people not going to church, and churches and schools are closing everywhere. So what I've been promoting in our parish here the last few years is a very simple strategy. Two words, invest and invite. And it's that simple. That simple. Invest in a person you know that you want to get to know better, maybe in a relationship. Invest in them, and then at the appropriate moment, invite them. Invite them specifically to come to church here. And we propose to partner with you in that endeavor. From our hospitality ministry to our parish musicians, lifting up people in worship, and the preaching here to nourish people, we propose to give that person a welcoming experience to encounter Christ. That's what it's all about. There's a couple problems that we have as Catholics with this thought about being missionaries. First of all, we don't know what that means. We've never been taught what that means. You went to 12 years of Catholic school, no one ever shared with you to go out to share your faith with a friend. It's just not something that Catholics were taught, and so we don't know how to do it. And the second thing is, perhaps we've left it to the professionals over the years, you know? The priests, the nuns, the foreign missionaries that work in faraway country. That's how you were raised as Catholics to think about mission work. And the third thing is the why. Why should I do it? Why should I share my faith with another person? We have an attitude in our culture today, live and let live. That person has their beliefs and I have my beliefs. And so why is this so important? So we're going to look at this in the next couple weeks and just a little background on Matthew's gospel that we just heard. Deacon Max is going to preach the next two weeks. He's going to talk more about the what and the how. Today I want to talk about that why. You see, Jesus here in Matthew chapter 10 is giving the disciples a kind of training exercise. He is giving them a speech and then he's sending them out with their training wheels on, as little baby disciples to go make disciples. Remember that the first disciples were not pros. They didn't go to seminary. They didn't have professional degrees. They didn't know the scripture even that well. They were fishermen. They were teenagers. And Jesus called them because he saw their potential. It's like a trade. So if any of you are in construction, or electricians, or plumbers, or firemen. You maybe went to trade school, but probably you learned your job mostly from your mentors, from on-the-job training, from your experience. Well, that's what Jesus is doing with his first disciples that he gathers, that we heard about today. And the context is that Jesus in ministry, as he's going from town to town, from village to village in Galilee, at this point, has become popular. He has proclaimed the kingdom. He has healed the sick. He has cast out demons. And now there's a big crowd. So that's the context. Matthew then tells us this. At the sight of the crowds, Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Notice here the heart of the Son of God. The heart of the Son of God. Jesus is moved with pity for those in the margins. This reminds me that he gets us. He understands us, no matter where we've been and where we are now. He feels our loss, our sense of being abandoned, our sense of being troubled or isolated in any way. You know, if you are feeling that way right now, if you're feeling abandoned or lost or alone, no that you're welcome here. We are glad that you are here. I want to tell you that 
I, I've just heard this recently, the most welcome sign, the most inclusive sign, I think, is the sign of the cross. Because that tells us God loves you, and he wants you, and he welcomes you here. So Jesus' heart, as Matthew tells us, his compassion moves him then to give this training speech, what he's about to say. So he launches into it and says this, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for the harvest. This has always been true, the fact that there have been too few laborers for the harvest. It's true today, certainly, and it was true back then. You may have grown up in your neighborhood, at your parish, with a rectory that was full of priests, that a, with a convent that was full of religious sisters, and they all taught your parish school, and everyone went to church, and everyone was Catholic. But even then, I'm betting there were problems. I've heard it said, you know, Catholics, we were sacramentalized, but we weren't evangelized. In other words, we all received our sacraments, but perhaps we never got to know Jesus in our heart. We never really even knew about that, to have a relationship with Christ. And so Jesus here is beginning, very importantly, in prayer. Ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for the harvest. What is, what is his first step in, in being a missionary? The first task to do, it's got to be prayer. So pray, I know you do, for vocations to the priesthood. We have one guy next week, Michael Voris in our diocese, who's going to be ordained a priest. Please pray for him. And pray for more young men to enter the seminary. Pray for religious sisters. But also pray, please, for the culture of the church to be oriented more and more and more toward, toward mission. Because the key, the why, is to share in the heart of Christ to share in that heart of compassion for the lost sheep. We can't do it without that heart that we all share it. So this means welcoming those who are far from God. But Matthew then continues. He tells us, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. But the 12 were chosen Specifically because Jesus saw their potential. He saw leadership qualities in them. And then in this exercise, he's about to send them out. He's giving them authority. So this reminds me of the importance of exercising authority. I exercise as pastor my authority best by delegating, by listening, by collaborating. Because if I try to do it by myself, I'm going to burn out. And I'm only going to have a limited effect. Good leaders, I've been told, good leaders, they have followers. But great leaders, they empower and equip other leaders. So that's what I try to do. And there, there's sometimes, yes, I do have to exercise my authority. Somebody gave me uh, a couple of Christmases ago a t-shirt. It says, don't make me use my pastor's voice. I love it. I'll show it to you. <laughs> but all of you have an authority as well. You have an authority in whoever you have influence over. It may be within your household, in your marriage, as husband or wife, with your children. It may be at work. It may be among your circle of friends or on a sports team. Wherever you have influence, you have authority. And so go use that authority. Well, Jesus then goes on to call and name the 12 apostles I'm not going to read that list. You know it. And he gives them further instructions. But we'll hear more about those further instructions in the next couple of weeks. But at one point, Jesus says to them, importantly, without cost, you have received. Without cost, you are to give. So I'm in ministry for the money. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Seeing if you're paying attention there. <laughs> I remember hearing on a retreat before my ordination, have a supreme contempt for your own convenience. That always stuck with me. Have a supreme contempt for your own convenience. So whenever I feel 
lazy or self-serving or selfish, I'm reminded of that Monsignor yelling that in my ear <laughs> to strive to know that my calling is not primarily for myself, but it is for others. I just want to tell one key story that I haven't shared that was key to my vocation. It happened in the middle of my seminary years because I was floundering for a couple of years of my calling, thinking maybe I'm not up to it. Maybe I should go get married. Maybe I should leave the seminary. At one point, I had the great opportunity to go on a retreat in all places, in Omaha, Nebraska, <laughs> in Crichton University. This place is like the Holy Land for me. And at the end of that retreat, for the first time, I experienced the love of God. And it's very hard for me to put in words. I experienced the love of God in such a deep, complete way. And just to try to put into words, the prayer that I want to share with you is a prayer uh, that, I, that I had at the end of that retreat. It's a prayer called Take and Receive from St. Ignatius of Loyola. He says, Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. All that I have and call my own, you have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Though so that prayer is accompanied with is my thoughts of discovering the love of God at a fountain on the campus of Crichton University and in a deep abiding way. And you may not be ready to say that prayer. You may not be ready in your spiritual life, and that's okay. But discovering the love of God is the why. Why are we missionaries? It's because of the abiding, overwhelming love that he has for you and for me. So a couple steps for this week, a couple uh, items for your homework. First, pray this week for God to send laborers to the harvest. But pray even more that you share in Christ's heart. That you share ever more, ever more simply in his heart for the loss. This is the most important starting point. Just as Christ and this training exercise first called the first disciples to pray, that's got to be our first step. Recall God's love for you in Christ. And maybe you are ready to say that prayer. Maybe you can recall moments, holy moments in your life where God was there. You can only give what you have received. You can't share what you haven't been given. And so perhaps you haven't receive the love of God. Pray to begin to be open to, to encounter him and his love. And then that's the first step is prayer. Pray and remember and recall to encounter the love of God. The second step is to begin to think about that person in your life that you need to share in your faith because you have a unique platform. You have a unique authority and influence. I can't go to your homes, your workplaces. I can't go on vacation with you necessarily, <laughs> but you're there. That's your job. That's your duty. And who can you influence with the love of God? Here's the key. A lot of you, I know, have adult children who don't go to church. And instead of trying the, the trital tactic that doesn't work, to try to guilt them, <laughs> to try to shame them, to tell them, uh, that you're breaking their heart because they're not going to church. You know that routine doesn't work. Instead of that, tell them what your faith has meant to you. Tell them about the love of Christ and what it's meant to you. In that time of crisis, when you were going through that illness, or when you were divorced, whenever you had a moment in which God's love was overwhelming, share about that. And that's the, the key, I think, to why we're missionaries, to why we go out and invest and invite in others. And so, bottom line, my friends, we are the church. 
not just the Pope and the bishops and the priests and the nuns. We are the church. We are missionaries. So let's go out to announce the good news. Amen.